Thank you. Thank you. Um, they gave me a script, and they just gave me permission to deviate from it. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, I first met Walter Isaacson about a month ago in Washington, D.C., and he gave me a copy of his new book. And I was really excited because I love coming home from trips for something for my, with something for my wife. And um, I got home, and I was like, honey, I've got a copy of Walter's new book because I knew she was a big fan. And she's like, well, now we have two copies because... <laughs> She'd gone out and bought it that afternoon. It is a spectacular book, and if you haven't um, read Walter Isaacson, it's, uh, it's, it's a joy to read him because he connects us with the devices that connect our lives. These days, every one of you is carrying around something that has dozens and dozens of independent uh, technological streams that have all merged together to give us the connectivity that we uh, just assume today. Um, Walter is the best person I know at explaining the connections that lead to the things that change our lives. And in his new book, The Innovators, How a Group of Hackers, Geniuses, and Geeks Created the Div Digital Revolution, Walter strings together not just the hero stories, but the stories that you wouldn't hear because these things are not made by individuals. And Walter does a phenomenal job of explaining how the teamwork involved and the history is exciting and riveting. And now I will just go back to my script for one thing which I could not say better. I'm going to quote Salon.com which said, if anyone in America understands genius, it is Walter Isaacson. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Jim. Notice they didn't say I was a genius. It's just I've actually written about a few people who are. And it's great to be back here at uh, the Miami Book Festival, something I've loved for many, many years. Now that Tom Healy has taken it over, that's great. And I particularly want to thank both Jim McKelvey and also Eduardo Padron, who is the president of uh, Miami-Dade Community College, this great place, because they are doing in their own different ways something that is really important for the digital revolution, which is make it inclusive. Make sure everybody can be part of this revolution. And you may know that Jim has created something called Launch Code. Launch Code started in St. Louis. It's going to come here to Miami soon. It's going to be all over the world. But what it is is in a very easy time. In six weeks for free, you can learn coding. You can be part of the revolution. And likewise, I think this is the greatest community college in America. And I want to thank Eduardo Padron for hosting us. I've been working on this book, The Innovators, for really 20 years off and on. It began when I ran uh, digital media for Time Magazine back in the days before we knew what digital media was, before we could even get directly on the internet, and before there were web browsers in the early 1990s. But when the web browsers and the idea of putting the magazine on the internet came along, we started to do it, and I got called in by the, my boss, the president of Time Inc., and he asked me a very simple question, which is, who owns the internet? And of course, I thought, that's a clueless question. You know, so was, and then he said, well, I mean, like, who built it? Who runs it? Who's in charge of it? And I realized that besides being a clueless question, I did not know the answer to that question. <laughs> and I started gathering string, because the good thing about being at Time and running uh, digital media was I got to meet all these people, people I had never heard of, but really should be heroes of a revolution, like Ben Franklin and George Washington are of their revolution. People like Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, who did the internet protocols, and people like Lick Lick Leiter, who created interactive computing. And they all lead up to people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Larry uh, Page, Sergey Brin, the people who we all know as leaders of this revolution. And I was lucky enough to be able to meet these people, and I started gathering strings, started collecting stories about them. I'd say to them, a Gordon Moore, you know, okay, when you founded Intel and you got to Moore's Law, tell me that story. I come from Louisiana, which, like southern Florida, is a place filled with storytellers, and it's always great to be a journalist because you can always ask the simplest of all questions, which is, tell me a story. Tell me your story. So I was gathering these stories. I put it aside, as you may know, when Steve Jobs called. I had done a biography of Benjamin Franklin and one of Albert Einstein. Steve called and said, why don't you do me next? 
I must admit, my first reaction was, you know, because he's my age, I'm like, that. But then uh, when I was told that um, he was fighting off cancer, I realized it would be a great chance to be part of being up close to somebody who had really been a revolutionary. Uh, he was a revolutionary, and we biographers know that we distort history a little bit. We make it seem like there's a visionary, you know, a, a Edison or a Morse or a Steve Jobs or a Bill Gates or an Einstein in a garret or a garage, and they have a light bulb moment, and all of a sudden innovation occurs. But one of the things about studying Steve Jobs was I realized he was a visionary. He was somebody who really pushed the world forward, made a dent in the universe by his creative vision, but he also did it collaboratively. He was a strong cup of tea, those of you who uh, know about him. He was sometimes hard to work with, but everybody I talked to said, yes, he drove me crazy, but I wouldn't have given up the chance in my life to have worked with him because he drove me to do things I didn't know I'd be able to do. So at uh, the end of my time with uh, Steve, when it was, he was stepping down from Apple and he was sick, I asked him a question which was, um, what product are you most proud of? And I thought he would say the original Macintosh or maybe you know, the iPod or the iPhone. And he said, uh, you aren't listening. He was always a bit tough. Uh, and he said, uh, those are hard products to create. But what's really hard is to create a team that endures and continues to create great product. The product I'm most proud of is Apple. And that's when I realized, as Jim said in his introduction, that this is not just about lone geniuses, but about how to form creative teams. And that's what all of us do in our lives, is we realize we bounce ideas around with people. We each play our roles. Some person might be the visionary. Some person might be good at execution. And you know, vision without execution is just hallucination. So you need to put these people together. You need to put Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak with also a whole lot of engineers who can build the Mac or create Apple. And so that was the first lesson I learned. The second lesson I learned from Steve Jobs was when I had my first long walk with him. And we talked about the fact that he was a humanities kid, as he put it, growing up. He loved the arts. He loved literature. He loved novels. He said, but I was also an electronics geek, and I thought that was strange. And I kind of related to that, not that I'm Steve Jobs, but I was one of those kids who soldered Heathkit radios and made ham radios, you know, WA5, John Thomas Peter, and knew how to make circuits and use a soldering iron and not mess things up too much. But I was basically a humanities kid, and he said, I learned from reading something that Edwin Land said that the people who stand at the intersection of the arts and the sciences are going to be the place where creativity occurs. That's what we're learning in our education today. It's not just about STEM, it's about humanities and the arts, but also those of us in the humanities and the arts ought to make sure that we understand the technology so we don't cede that ground to the engineers. So by that point, I had a framework for the book, and my daughter, who was then about whatever it is, you're applying to college, 16 or 17. She was applying to college, and um, being the type of parents my wife and I are, we thought we were supposed to be involved with this process. We were supposed to hover and say, what are you writing your entrance essay about? Can we read it? Aren't we supposed to edit it? And she, being the type of daughter she was, was having none of that. And one day, she just came down and said, I've done it. I said, what, what did you do? And she said, Ada Lovelace. I said, remind me again? She said, yeah, Ada Lovelace, Lord Byron's daughter. She was the first computer programmer. And I realized that she was a good frame for the book I was trying to write. Because Ada Lovelace, which is where the book begins and where the book ends, was, as I said, Lord Byron's daughter. And in the early 1800s, she... Uh, is growing up with a poetical streak because her father is a great romantic poet. But her mother, Lady Byron, is a mathematician, and her mother does not want Ada to grow up to be like her father. Those of you who know anything about Lord Byron would know that uh, Lady Byron at that point thought he was too much of a romantic poet. He had wandered off <laughs> never to be seen again. And so she had Ada tutored mainly in mathematics, as if understanding mathematics was an antidote to being poetic or romantic. <laughs> it didn't quite work because what Ada Lovelace does is she combines poetry with mathematics. She calls it poetical science. She stands at that intersection that I mentioned that Steve Jobs had talked about. And soon as I read that, I remembered that intersection that was on the slides that Steve Jobs used to show at every product launch 
go to YouTube and you can find it. And on the screen behind them, when the product launch was over, there'd just be a street sign that said liberal arts technology. And he would say, that's where we stand at Apple, at that intersection. So I was thinking of Ada standing at that intersection and reading about her because she wandered around Industrial Revolution England uh, in the 1830s. And she saw the mechanical looms that were using punch cards to do beautiful patterns. They were mechanized looms. Her father, Lord Byron, was a Luddite. And I mean that literally. His only speech in the House of Lords was defending the followers of Ned Ludd, who were smashing the mechanical looms on the theory that the technology was putting creative people out of work. Back then in the 1830s, they thought that technology would uh, put people out of work. They were wrong then. They're wrong now when they think that, but Ada knew they were wrong, and she looked at the punch cards that were doing these looms, and she had a friend named Charles Babbage who was making a calculating machine, a numerical calculator, and it was using punch cards, and she came up with a concept that is basically the heart of what the computer revolution is all about, which is that with the punch cards or any type of programming, you can make a numerical machine do anything, she put it, anything that can be noted in symbols. Words, she said, music, art, patterns. And so she came up and even showed in a published scientific paper, which at that period was not usual for a woman to be publishing in scientific journals. She publishes a paper that describes how this would work, and she even publishes step by step in a chart the first computer programming, how you would instruct a machine to do a particular task that she had undertaken. And it is a program that uh, goes step by step, but has recursive loops and all sorts of embedded things. Something a C++ coder here at Miami Dade would look at and say, I get it, that's what, they do. That's what we do. So in other words, she's a pioneer computer programmer. It also am amazed me that there were so many women at the beginning of this revolution that had been somewhat written out of history. And so I leap forward 100 years to the 1930s, late 1930s, when real computers finally come into existence. And to me, this is the beginning of a revolution, but it's like the Industrial Revolution, because two things happen. It's not just the steam engine and mechanical processes the way the Industrial, uh, I mean, the industrial Revolution is not just a steam engine or mechanical processes. It's combining the two. When you start combining a steam engine with mechanical processes, you get an industrial revolution. And what happened for the uh, digital revolution was the combination of computers with networks, uh, the personal computer and the internet, eventually. And to me, it was a true revolution. And I realized I had been writing about revolutions in the past. I wrote about the scientific revolution, certainly the American revolution we all know about. And I did Benjamin Franklin, because I felt you should know the heroes of that revolution, because if you want to understand the values of America, where we're coming from and where we're going, it helps to know how our founders got us started. And yet, there was no real history of the digital revolution. There was nobody who had sort of tried to tie it all together and say, here are the unknown heroes of that revolution. I got an email about an hour ago from a friend of mine I went to college with who had read the book, and he said, you know, you're writing the history of our generation just like other people wrote the history of, you know, Vietnam or World War II or the Depression generations, because the history of our generation, the revolution of our generation was not political, not military. It was a digital revolution. And so I leaped to the 1930s, having set it up with Ada Lovelace, and you get to an amazing character who you're going to learn a lot more about next week because I wanted to take him out of the shadows of history. His name is Alan Turing. So I worked very hard to take him out of the shadows of history, but next week Benedict Cumberbatch is playing him in a movie, and so we'll do it a thousand times better than I'll be able to do. And it's a really cool movie called The Imitation Game. And what um, <clears throat> Alan Turing did was threefold. First of all, he loves history. He understands Ada Lovelace. He builds on Ada Lovelace and the notion of a general purpose computer because he has to solve a very complicated math problem. And as much as I love math, I won't burden you with the problem, except for it's somewhat related to Gödel's incompleteness theory. How do you figure out whether things are provable or not in math? And he wants to figure it out, and he does a mechanical process to do so. 
And to do it, he comes up with the concept of a machine that can compute any logical sequence. He calls it a logical computing machine. It's basically universal. It can do anything. He uses it to solve the math problem, but frankly, the math problem, except for a few math geeks here, is not the more important part. The more important part was this concept of the universal or total logical computing machine that could do anything. That's Alan Turing's contribution. Then he goes to Bletchley Park, England, secretly, where they're trying to break the German wartime codes. And there he uh, works. He's very much a loner. He's a long distance runner. When he got sent off to boarding school, his parents had gone to India in the Foreign Service. He's left alone. He rides his bicycle for two days to go to boarding school. At boarding school, he discovers that he's gay, has a crush on a boy there who then dies of tuberculosis. So by the time Alan Turing gets to Bletchley Park, he's quite a loner and feels like the outsider, but he learns as I was saying at the very beginning, it's all about collaboration, all about teamwork. He's got to have people have his back if he's going to do these things. And so what they do is they break the German wartime codes, which may have done more than anything else to help us win World War II. And finally, coming out of it, because he's wrestled with this question, both of his homosexuality, free will, are we programmed, or we are who we are because we're like machines that are pre-programmed, or do we have free will, he wrestles with what he calls Lady Lovelace's objection. Because Ada Lovelace, at the end of her paper saying machines can do everything and anything, had a caveat. She said, the one thing they won't be able to do is have imagination. They won't be able to originate thought. Machines will never think. Machines are different from humans. Alan Turing says, how would we know that? How can we test that? Alan Turing is wrestling with this notion. Are we fundamentally different from machines? So Alan Turing um, comes up with what he calls the imitation game. As I said, it's the name of the movie. We now call it the Turing test, but it's simply a way to decide whether or not a machine is thinking. You take a machine and you put it in a different room uh, with a human. You send in questions, and if after a while you can't tell the difference between the answers coming back from one side and the answer coming back from the other side. You can't tell which is the machine and which is the human. He says that there's no reason to believe uh, that a machine isn't thinking. Now, if you're in the philosophy departments, you can argue all about consciousness and whether or not that's a good test, but it has become the defining test of machine learning and artificial intelligence of the digital age, and it sets up two strands of the digital revolution. The people like Ada Lovelace who believe that the point was to connect humans and technology, humanities and science, that the, that the imagination and creativity of us humans connected to the processing power of machines would each augment each other and that that partnership, the symbiosis as she called it, would always be stronger than machines alone. And those who believe in the quest, and you'll have them here on the stage at some point, of artificial intelligence and believe we're going to have robots that'll not need us anymore and be smarter than us, and there'll be a singularity and we'll all be useless. I tend to be an optimist. I'm on Ada's side. I believe that the combination of humans and machines has always been more powerful than the quest for strict or pure artificial intelligence. I don't know what will happen in the future, but I always know that ever since Alan Turing wrote the imitation game paper, People said, in 20 years, we'll have artificial intelligence. You can read that in any story in the New York Times in the 1950s, and you can go to the very beginning of this year, and it still says, in 20 years, there's going to be neuromorphic chips, and they'll bring us artificial intelligence. There's a wonderful guy in my book that I'll get to in a moment named J.C.R. Licklider. Lick Licklider said, maybe so, but in the meantime, why don't we connect ourselves more closely to our machines, because that's going to be more useful. So in all the data points we have of the 60 years or so, uh, of the digital revolution has been that the combination that Ada envisioned of the humanities and technology, of humans and machines, has always proved more fruitful than the quest for pure artificial intelligence. Now, Alan Turing's own life, in some ways, is tragic, heroic, and somewhat of a reminder that maybe we aren't machines. Uh, after he does the imitation game, uh, he, they, he debates it with people. People keep saying, you know, uh, that's not how it works. You have to have consciousness. You have to have impulses. You have to have sexual desires to be a human, whereas a machine wouldn't have that. 
he went kind of silent during those parts of the BBC debates because at that time, he was engaged in activity when those BBC debates over the imitation game were happening that were so human, a machine would have found him incomprehensible. He had picked up a 19-year-old young man, moved in, the young man had moved in with him, they had formed a relationship, gets burglarized, he admits to the police that uh, they have a sexual relationship, and I think the police somewhat reluctantly, because he is somewhat of a national hero, arrest him for it, because it was still illegal back then, very tragic. And they sentence him to, as if he were a machine, have hormone treatments to change his orientation. It's really weird, it's as if you could reprogram the basic essence of who we are as humans. Totally wrong. But he goes along with it, takes it in stride for a while, but then one night, he takes an apple, dips it in the cyanide, bites into it, and commits suicide. Uh, that's not something a machine would have done. The imitation game was over. It was clear, Alan Turing was human. And to me, that's an inspirational thing, which is a great heroic person who makes us understand the nature of our humanity and how we have to respect each aspect of our humanity. That machine that he built with his team, Tommy Flowers and others at Bletchley Park, England, was a great electronic machine called Colossus, which helped break the code. But it wasn't, oddly enough, what you would call a Turing complete machine, a universal machine, because it only had one purpose, which was breaking the Enigma codes, or the German codes. Um, to be a real computer, because I asked myself in the book, who did the first computer? Who invented the computer? And you'd think it would be easy, since it's one of the most important inventions of our time. We'd know, is it Bell, or is it Morse, or is it Edison? You know, who's the guy or gal who invented the computer? Um, besides the computer at Bletchley Park, there are two computers that are really in contention in the United States for this. There's one in Germany by Hermann Zuse, but it gets bombed by the Allies during the war. He never completes it. Or the one that would be a full electronic computer. There's a guy at Iowa State uh, named John Vincent Adanasoff. And this illustrates the difference between the loners and the people who know how to build teams. John Vincent Adanasoff was a loner. He built a machine, an electronic machine, that he hoped would be a computer in the basement of the physics building at Iowa State. And whenever he needed to figure it out, he didn't have a whole team around him. He had only one graduate student working with him. He would get in his Oldsmobile and take long drives uh, from Iowa. Actually, he often drove to the Illinois border because in Illinois you could buy liquor by the drink, which you couldn't do in Iowa, so he'd have a few drinks and he would clarify his thoughts that way. So he comes back and he pretty much gets the machine you know, conceptualized, but it doesn't fully work. Why? Because he doesn't have mechanics, he doesn't have a team, the punch card burners don't really work, they kind of jam, other parts of the process don't work, it has a mechanical element. And in 1942, he gets called off and goes into the Navy and he leaves the machine in the basement of the building, and a year later it gets dismantled by somebody else who took over his office, didn't know what this contraption was, and throws it away. It would be lost to history because, as I say, Creativity is a collaborative and team sport. Had it not been for the other person, who I actually think is the foremost visionary of the computer in America, and somebody you probably haven't heard of, but I think is an exemplar of what the digital revolution was about, a guy named John Mockley, who from um, Washington, D.C., was part of that crowd of people who love sharing ideas. He was part of the Smithsonian and their nighttime things. He was part of the Carnegie Institute. He loved going to wood panel buildings and book festivals and everything else. We could be around and listen to people and share papers. So he goes around trying to figure out, how do I make a computer? And he uh, visits Bell Labs. He goes to the 1939 World's Fair and sees things. He goes up to Dartmouth, where Snibbets has done the computer. He goes up to Harvard, where there's the Mark I electromechanical computer, not fully electronic, that Grace Hopper is uh, uh, um, programming and Howard Aiken is building. And he even hears about this guy, John Vincent Adanasoff, out in Iowa. So Mockley takes his poor nine-year-old kid and puts him in a car and drives all the way out to Iowa to a state to visit this computer. And he spends four days there kind of looking at the computer, learning what he can from it. This becomes a bonanza for those of you in this room who are intellectual property or patent lawyers. It ends up being a fight for 20 years of did he steal things. But for me, it's not about stealing. As Steve Jobs said, 
good artists borrow, great artists steal. And uh, if you're going to be a collaborator in the digital age, you really have to pick up ideas from all over the place. That's what innovation is. It's saying, I found this idea, I'm combining it with this idea. As Ada Lovelace said, imagination is the combining facility. You combine ideas from all over. So Mockley gets back to the University of Pennsylvania with all of these ideas, and he says, but I'm going to need a team. So he hires, uh, not hires, he partners with Presper Eckert, a great mechanic and engineer who's, I think, one of his grandfather or something had been a, invented the Turkish taffy machine, so he knows how to, you know, make machines that don't get all gummed up or whatever. Uh, there are all sorts of mechanics. There are people who do information theory helping them. And there are actually two, six great women mathematicians who are there to program it, just in the tradition of Ada Lovelace. Uh, they were great women mathematicians because one of the things that surprised me, Grace Hopper, for example, who was doing this at Harvard, got her PhD in math from Yale. And it stunned me to know that more women got PhDs in math in the 1930s than a generation later, both in proportion and absolute numbers. It was before women were told that they didn't know how to do math. And so they are at the forefront of this revolution. And what they do is the programming. And um, the boys with their toys, you know, Eckert and Mockley and all, they think that the hardware is the important thing, but the women actually know that it's not just how it's wired, you have to be able to reprogram it because it's doing ballistic missile tests, it's got to then do atom bomb explosions, and they write programming languages collaboratively. Grace Hopper from Harvard helps. They create things like COBOL, and in the end, it's the programming languages that become more important than whether it's just Honeywell or Sperry. RAND or UNIVAC uh, hardware is what programming languages and what operating systems are you using. The unfortunate thing is that women have often been written out of the history of computer programming. Um, the day they finally unveil ENIAC, which is this machine at Penn that uh, Presper Eckert and Mockley and the six women and 80 other people created, it's Valentine's Day of 1946, because the war is finally over. They don't have to be secret about this machine. They have a huge demonstration for the press and all the dignitaries from Washington. And uh, the women have to stay up, two of them. Uh, Jean Jennings, whose book, uh, Pioneer Programmer, it's a memoir came out a couple years ago right after she died, is a great little book explaining what it was like to go from Atlantis Grove, Missouri, to be programming the first computer. Uh, all these women, they program a wonderful demonstration that makes a front page of the New York Times. It's a historic thing, all the lights blinking. And then everybody goes off to Houston Hall at Penn for this great candlelit dinner with all the dignitaries, but the six women are not invited. They take the bus back to their apartments on Valentine's Day of 1946, a cold February night. And you see after that, the role of women begun, begins to decline a bit in computing. Even in 1984, I think close to 40% of undergraduates studying computer science at American universities were women. Nowadays, it's 17%. It's gone in the wrong direction. There are many reasons for that, which you all you know, can encourage people to write books on. My only slice at this is that women didn't have enough role models in a way. As my daughter said when I asked her about Ada Lovelace, she said, yeah, until I heard of Ada Lovelace, I wa you know, she was a math person, she loved computers. She said, until I heard of Ada Lovelace, the only woman programmer of a computer I'd ever heard about was a character in a Batman comic. And so it's useful since my father was an electrical engineer, my uncles were, I had those role models and loved electronics. It's useful for people to have role models if they're going to be inspiring or innovators. And that's indeed what we do when we write this book. We say these are your people who can be role models. These are people who can help you understand what innovation is all about. Now, the computer is a pretty cool thing, but the ENIAC had, I think, 17,400 vacuum tubes. This means it's not something you can take home or try at home. In order to make a great revolution, it had to be made personal, because that's the narrative arc of the digital revolution. It's taking our wonderful devices and doing what Ada Lovelace said, connecting them more intimately to us, making them more personal. So you have to have things like the computer. Uh, you have to have people like Lick Licklider. As I said, he's one of the heroes in the book. He had been at MIT. He was at a private company, sort of aligned with MIT. It was right after World War II, and there was something that happened right after World War II that really helped America become 
the powerhouse of the digital age. And that was that there was a collaboration between government funding and government, universities, and private companies. It was a three-way collaboration in which from Bell Labs to BBN and other places to SRI and Stanford and RAND, you had these places in which the government was no longer building research labs like where they built the atom bomb, but instead funding research at universities. Universities and government were collaborating with private companies to put it into practice. That's now sort of blown up. We've cut our research funding. We're destroying the seed corn for future inventions, but also that sense that we're all in this together. Now corporations think they're at war with the government and universities, but J.C.R. Licklider was the heyday, and the Eisenhower administration was the heyday of this combination. Lick Licklider is doing an air defense system, um, and he realizes a few things, one of which is if you're going to have a good air defense system, you have to have quick interactive computers. Things like ENIAC that I told you about, these were big old computers, and usually you had to bring your punch cards as if you were offering them to an oracle, and there would be priests standing around. I remember that, my Fortran punch cards, and then the next day you'd get your answer back. That doesn't work when a missile is coming in. You need interactivity. <laughs> Secondly, you need really good graphical user interfaces. By that I mean what you see on the screen has got to be really easy to understand. Can't be all those little command lines. And so Lick Lick Lighter helps create a screen in which you can tell the difference between a passenger plane, incoming missile, and a pigeon, which is quite useful for an air defense system. <laughs> and a you know, console jockey can do it right away. But you know, we don't think of that as being that important, but that is a key to doing what I said was the Ada tradition, is making us more comfortable with our machines. That they're easy, they're, they're friendly, convivial, it's sometimes called. And finally, he knows that we have to network all these air defense systems together. He's a funny guy from Missouri. He loves uh, giving credit more than taking it, so he calls it the Intergalactic Computer Network. When he goes to the Pentagon, he gets made the first director of ARPA, the Advanced Research Project Agency's um, Information Processing Division. So he calls it ARPANET, and it becomes, of course, the backbone of what is now the Internet. And he delegates this to all the people so that it's a collaborative process. Lick Lick Lighter was also, like everybody in my book, deeply into art, music, because he believed that the connection between art and science was what creativity is about. He used to go to museums with some of his engineers, and they would stand in front of a picture for maybe an hour, one of them said. And they would look at each brush stroke. And they would say, OK, how did that add to the creativity? What was the artist thinking? He said he tried to create that in the engineering as well. But it was a collaborative process to create something like ARPANET or the internet. And what he does is all the research centers that are now being funded by the Pentagon as part of this triangle I mentioned, they're told they have to be part of this network. And not only that, they have to figure out how their computers are going to communicate with the what are called imps, but basically packet switches or routers that are sent to each of the universities. And being great uh, universities, they do what professors at great universities do. They delegated this task to their graduate students. <laughs> so you have a group of graduate students at you know, UCLA, where Lynn Kleinrock's lab is, and SRI next to Stanford and University of Utah, all the University of California, Santa Barbara, where the original sites were, and of course in Cambridge, Mass., where they're making the packet switches and routers. And in order to do it, they decide to make it very collaborative. There's a guy named Steve Crocker who I ran into years ago. I'll explain why. But he was one of the two graduate students uh, who helped write down what they were doing in the early days of the rules for this new network. And he said that he wanted to make sure that everybody felt included. He did not want it to be top down. He wanted no hierarchy, no bosses, no commands. It was all going to be done collaboratively. He's standing in the shower at his girlfriend's parents' house. It was the only place he can think when he's staying at his girlfriend's parents' house, I guess. And he wants to know even what to call them. He doesn't want to call them the protocols or the instructions or the you know, plans or the proposals even for how you would take, say, a packet, break it up, put a header block on it, have the header block tell the packets to you know, recombine when they got to the 
uh, destination, those type of things you had to do. He says, how can I do it so everybody feels included? He finally comes up with the idea of calling it requests for comment. All they do is they write these things out, they decide how they think it might be done, and they call it a request for comment. So everybody feels collaborative, as if they can be a part of it. The interesting thing is that DNA is inbred into the internet as we see it today. There's no central hub, there's no command, nobody runs the thing, as I should have told my boss back then when he first asked me, nobody has a switch. There's no hub, like a phone system, or even regional hubs, like an airline system. Every single node on the internet has equal power to transmit, receive, whatever, store packets. And at one point, uh, we at Time Magazine wrote that the reason it was done this way was so it would survive a Soviet attack. That if the Soviets bomb, you know, the hub of any system like that, it could take out the communication system, but by having a, a distributed packet switch network, which this was, nobody could take it out. You bomb any of the nodes, the internet routes around it. You try to censor the nodes, as we know today. The internet routes around it. So we wrote in Time Magazine that it was there designed to survive a nuclear attack. Uh, we get a letter from Stephen Crocker, somebody I'd never heard of. This is back in the 90s. He said, no, I was there. That's not why we designed it. We didn't design it to survive a nuclear attack. And um, so he wrote a letter explaining why. Time Magazine back then, believe it or not, was somewhat arrogant. So I wrote him back and said, we're not going to print your letter because we have better sources than you. And our sources tell us it was done to survive a nuclear attack. I was there. I found it amusing. And so when I was writing this book, I walked the cat back because I went back to the files of Time Magazine. The better source was a guy named Stephen Lukasich who uh, had taken over from Lick Lick Lighter and ran the office in the Pentagon that was funding it. And Lukasich says, and he even writes a paper saying, you know, we did it even though the people who were building it didn't know we were doing it and getting the funding from Congress and from the colonels in the Pentagon because it was going to be a survivable command structure in case of a nuclear attack. So you can tell Steve Crocker that I was on top and he was on the bottom, so he didn't really know what was happening. I had coffee with Steve Crocker one day at a coffee shop in suburban Washington. I mentioned that to him. He said, well, you can tell Steve Lukasich that I was on the bottom and he was on the top, so he didn't know what was happening. <laughs> and in some ways, they're both right. That's the beauty of the internet, is that it is distributed and collaborative. Now, in order to make a true revolution happen, you had to do what I mentioned early on, which is connect the network to the computer. Uh, the computers had become, you know, these big old things, but they kept getting smaller and smaller. And eventually you have the personal computer gets born. Now, it gets born in the early 1970s in a really cool way. There are a lot of tribes that come together, especially in California, in the Bay Area. People who are hippies, people with the electric Kool-Aid acid tets of Ken Kesey, people who are in communes and reading the whole Earth catalog once too often and, um, <laughs> say, access to tools. And they believe that the tools should be controlled by people, not by the government or the Pentagon of corporations. You have the free speech movement at Berkeley. You have a lot of electronic hackers and you know, people from the electronics industries and their kids who are trying to jack into the phone company and rip off Ma Bell. All these people are there in the Bay Area, and uh, along with community organizers who want to bring computing power to the people. And so what happens is they all yearn for a personal computer, something the big corporations don't think there's any need for. But after a while, a few hobbyists come up, including most notably the Altair, which was a hobbyist computer you could solder in the early 1970s from a kit, and you could make a computer. It was pretty lame. It had a few lights at front, toggle switches, but you believed you had a computer. Everybody thought this was cool. It gets on the cover of Popular Electronics, and a couple things happen. One is, uh, at Harvard, I was there, unfortunately, um, there was somebody a little bit younger than me who was a little bit cooler than me, Bill Gates had convinced his friend Paul Allen to drop out of um, college, come live in Cambridge. Paul Allen sees Popular Electronics, the, the January issue comes out in late December 73, plucks down his 75 cents in the out-of-town news square in Harvard Square and runs to Courier House through the snow and says, this revolution is happening without us. 
you know, they built a personal computer. We got to be in on this. Bill Gates blows off all four of his exams and spends seven weeks with Paul Allen in a coding frenzy and creates BASIC for the personal computer and, of course, drops out of Harvard to join the revolution. The Altair with BASIC is brought to uh, around, they're showing it off in places, and it's brought to something called the Homebrew Computer Club of Palo Alto. Now the Homebrew Computer Club, by its very name, you can tell it's an amalgam of all these tribes. Whole Earth catalog types, electronic geeks, people who want control of their own tools, and they show off the Altair. A couple things happen. One is people have been waiting for programming, because as the women of ENIAC knew, the programming is more important than the hardware, they find Bill Gates' basic, which they've been waiting for, and they take the tape and they make 70 copies of it and give it away for free, because that was the mentality, the hacker mentality, software should be free. Another thing happens, which is Steve Wozniak is there at the first meeting, looks at this Altair and says, this is pretty lame, I can do something better. And he creates a circuit board that will be able to connect a, home, a computer circuit like that using the Intel 8080 processor, which he had looked at the spec sheet for, and it can connect it to a TV monitor and a keyboard. He said, this will be much better than that stupid Altair. So he does it, and he gets his friend Steve Jobs from down the street to help lug the TV to the next couple of meetings so they can show it off. And Woz, being one of those, you know, hacker information to be free, is handing out the spec sheets for his new computer to anybody who wants them for free. Until his friend Steve Jobs said, wait a minute, we can go to my parents' garage and we can make these things and sell them. And thus, out of that one small explosion there, you see the birth of Microsoft and the birth of Apple, the home computer. But initially, these computers are mainly used as personal devices. All these hackers, geeks, you know, commune types, they don't want to share their computers with the whole world. They want something they can take into the woods or whatever and have their own creativity tool. So even by the 1990s, when I was running new media and digital media for time, Personal computers were generally not connected into the networks. The real revolution hadn't happened. The steam engine had not been connected to the mechanical devices to be the combustible mix that makes a revolution. But in 1993 or so, right when I'm there, a few things happen. One of which is to give Al Gore his due, which, uh, you know, he's always sort of the joke when you say who invented the internet. He passes the Gore Act of 92 and then the Gore Act of 93 when he becomes vice president, which says that uh, the internet should be open to anybody who can get online. Instead of just being for people at research institutions, it should be public, it should be open, it should be free. And so until then, we were on things like America Online and CompuServe and Prodigy, and it was illegal for you to be on AOL and then go directly to the internet. You'd dial up, you'd get the modem, but you'd be in the walled garden of your online service providers. But in 1994, at the very beginning of the year, the web comes along. Tim Berners-Lee invents it. Mark Andreessen helps invent the web browser. It all comes together with the Gore Act, government policy. And soon, instead of just being online on your online service, you go out into something that's like the World Wide Web. It's really cool, and it helps bring it all together. We in the media business made a couple bad mistakes then. We started pouring old wine into new bottles. We should have realized that what we were doing on the online services was we were creating community. Because Aristotle knew this before any other techies of the day. You know, we're a social animal. We use our tools to create connectivity, community, communication. Online services were doing that with bulletin boards and chat rooms and auditoriums. But we get to the web and we should just start dumping Time Magazine online with maybe a comment section at the bottom that nobody ever read. But cool things happen because the street finds its own uses for things. People take over things. There's a kid I met back then when I was running new media. He said, you're doing it all wrong. He was a sophomore at Swarthmore College named Justin Hall. And he said, you're doing it all wrong. You're turning this into a publishing medium. It should be a community medium where people get to express themselves, where everybody gets to be part of it. And so he was keeping not only a list of cool websites, but he also kept a log. He called it a web log of his... Uh, activities, what girls would date him, exactly what happened when it did, pictures of his private parts, a poem about his father's suicide. It really skirted the line of too much information. <laughs> but it became the way we communicated online. And soon other people were doing web blogs. They eventually shortened the name of it to blogs. 
and all of a sudden, the street has found its use for this uh, web, and it becomes, once again, a community medium. I give that whole story this way, and then I'll open up for questions in a moment or two, because if you see everything I've talked about, it's been Ada Lovelace's vision that we end up connecting more carefully, more closely, more intimately with our machines, instead of creating machines that, as Lord Byron or Alan Turing would say, will replace us and get rid of us. And people say, well, haven't we gotten near artificial intelligence where machines can think in ways we can't, and that, you know, that isn't that what, say, Wikipedia it is. It has all this information. You can find anything there. And I say, no, Wikipedia is simply the connection of a great piece of software, wiki software, with human creativity. Millions of humans who are creating things every day for Wikipedia. I remember the wonders of crowdsourcing when it first happened. And when Wikipedia came, I was writing my Einstein book. And early on in that process, I did, being a geek, you know, I start editing stories on Wikipedia the way millions of others around the world. And I get involved with the Einstein story on Wikipedia, which is actually very great, the article on Einstein, except for it had one passage in it that said, in 1937, Einstein secretly traveled to Albania so that King Zog could give him a visa to escape the Nazis. Everything in that sentence is wrong. Uh, he didn't go to Albania. He didn't travel on an Albanian visa, King Zog, never matter, whatever. So I took it out, being, an, you know, anybody can edit, as you know, on Wikipedia, and boom, it comes right back in. So I take it out again, and I put my sources, boom, it comes right back in. I think this is ridiculous. But, you know, hardcore Albanian, you know, partisans and nationalists are proud of this, and they can point to some website where some uncle somewhere said that his cousin told him that they saw Einstein on the street in Albania, and, you know, whatever. And so I keep trying to, and finally, I'm like, I'm about to give up, but then all of a sudden it's no longer there. Now, I do not attribute this to the wisdom of crowds. I say the wisdom of crowds was, you know, messed up. They got it all wrong. It was me. I helped fix that. Then it slowly dawned on me that I'm just part of the crowd. One little person adding my tiny bit of wisdom occasionally to a crowdsourced medium, and that's why something like Wikipedia works. And even with Google, people say, well, doesn't it think on it? And you say, no, wait a minute. First of all, you can ask Google a really, really hard question, uh, and it'll, like, what's the depth of the Red Sea? And I don't know, but it'll say 5,347 feet or whatever. That's something your smartest friend doesn't even know. But if you ask it um, an easy question, like, can a crocodile play basketball, <laughs> you maybe get the Gators' uh, schedule. <laughs> but you don't get anything close to an answer but something a four-year-old could give you the answer after giggling a bit. So machines are still fundamentally different from the human mind, and there's no reason to separate the two. The Ada connection is what makes things work. And that's what Larry Page and Sergey Brin figured out when they were at Stanford. By the way, on a government-funded project, that's back when it still worked, that government research, private company, university collaboration, and they realize instead of having a web crawler go off and find out the answer to everything, what it should do is find out what other people, real humans, had made as links on their websites. And so what it does is it combines the thought and wisdom and links of millions and millions of people who create web pages with a computer algorithm. And that has always been sort of the strength of our digital revolution. And so the upshot of this story is, as I said at the beginning, it's always important to be able to stand at that intersection where the humanities meet technology. Because if we cede it all to the engineers, it won't be beautiful. It won't be like the iPod where Steve Jobs did it or the beautiful fonts on the original Mac. It won't be truly creative. And indeed, as we figure out our education, we have to make sure people are curious, that they question authority, because that's the one thing these innovators have in common, is they always say, how do we know that? Let me question authority, whether it's Alan Turing or Einstein looking at the first of paragraph of Newton's Principia that tells us time marches along, irrespective of how we observe it. And he says, how would we test that? How would we know that? So that's what they do. Or Steve said in his unbelievably beautiful 1997 ad when he came back to Apple, here's to the misfits, the rebels, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who think different, because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. 
And so it's that notion of questioning authority, being a rebel, can, being having that sense of art and humanities that's very important. But the other reason I wrote this book is it works both ways. A lot of you are nodding. I can tell the people nodding most vigorously in this crowd are the humanists, the ones who love Art Basel, the ones who go to the museums, the ones who believe in the importance of art. But those of us who are in that camp, who would be appalled if somebody said, I don't know what a Picasso, a Picasso is, or I don't know the difference between um, you know, Hamlet and Macbeth. And you'd say, whoa, what a Philistine. But people like that sometimes too easily are willing to joke that they don't know the difference between a um, gene and a chromosome, or the difference between an integral and a differential equation, or the difference uh, between a transistor and a capacitor. Those are hard things, but frankly, they're not as hard as Hamlet or Macbeth or Picasso's paintings. And they're also beautiful things. So those of us on either side of the divide, but those of us on the humanities art side of the divide, I hope you'll read this book and make an effort to see how beautiful it is to imagine how the electrons dance on a piece of silicon and how it becomes a semiconductor and how you can juice it and dope it with impurities, so it can become an on-off switch and replace that vacuum tube. I hope you'll understand the creativity of the engineers just as they should understand the creativity of the humanists. Because, as I said, if you're like Ada and you stand at the intersection, you can be like her. You can understand the beauty of a piece of poetry, like one of her dad's lines, you know, and visualize it. She walks in beauty like the night. You visualize that, even though it's a hard line to understand. But like Ada, she also could visualize what an algorithm did, what a step-by-step -step set of instructions did, what a mathematical equation would do, and how it would work. Because she knew that a feat of engineering, or a piece of coding, or a mathematical equation was just as much as a piece of poetry, the good Lord's brushstroke for painting something in our universe. And that, to me, is the lesson of the digital revolution. Thank you all. Hey, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I see people lining up. This is good. It means they're here to correct me and say, why did you leave out so-and-so? Which is a great uh, thing I regret in my, I think Bob Metcalf is here. He should have been in the book more too, but uh, there's so many heroes and I hope everybody can add to the book. Go ahead, sir. Yes, Walter. Uh, Hi. My, my name is Kai Bird. And I know you, Kai Bird. I've and read as your an book. Author, as an author, I, I've always wondered how you can write so many books and still have a full-time job. Well, but, your friend, but, but Marty seriously. Sherwin, knows I don't work that hard at the Aspen Institute. <laughs> But more seriously, I, on your current book, what is your take on Edward Snowden's revelations? And what, yeah. how are we going to save ourselves, our, our privacy from the internet? Well, I am an optimist, as you can tell. And I think that uh, I, I don't really approve of what Edward Snowden does, but I can certainly see the silver linings that come from the fact that what's happening now we're having a great debate. Laws are getting passed and not passed, and people are agonizing over it. And the most important thing, because you've written about this a lot, and you've written every, you know, from John McCloy to the you know, bomb or whatever, can we keep a step ahead of our technology? Will our moral sensibilities keep up with our technological advances? The answer, starting when Aristotle and Plato, I mean, Socrates and Plato are worrying about writing, helping destroy memory and the way our minds work, is yeah, we tend to keep up with our technology. With a few bad mistakes, like the atom bomb, we hadn't thought that through enough. But um, nowadays, we have thought it through. I mean, you know, it's somewhat amazing that uh, we wrestle with these things, that we are a moral animal. So now we're wrestling with the balance of privacy versus security and other things. I think we got the balance wrong, obviously, well, I shouldn't say obviously, but I think even the head of the NSA would say we got the balance wrong, and we got the balance wrong. Why I'm an optimist is I do think 
that this debate is happening in public, that we live in a country where an Edward Snowden is being prosecuted, but we can all stand up and say he shouldn't be. And you can even have Michael Hayden, I thought, on 60 Minutes saying of James Rice, and you know, I think what he did was wrong. He's, an, as you know, another person who's done these secrets, is wrong, but I wouldn't put him in jail because the reason we were doing that at the NSA was to protect the freedoms and liberties of our country. So we got the balance wrong, but we'll have to struggle to get it right. It's a messy process, but I'm kind of, I love living in a world where we can be debating Edward Snowden because it uses, and I'll end by this part by saying, you need to have the humanities, the philosophy, the politics and the history. Those are the muscles you have to use to combine with the technology, such as we can snoop. Well, what did we do when we had the postal system? What did your friend Colonel Stimson say about reading other people's mail? We have to sort that out, but it helps to know history, it helps to know the humanities in order to be do them in philosophy, to do the moral wrestling that we have to do every single day, uh, whether it's being the head of a, a cab hailing app that can then track people and where they're going and what they do with it. Every day, we got to figure out what's right, what's wrong. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, Walter. I'm, I'm, an, I'm Andrew with you. Yeah. I'm, I'm Brad Watson. We met at uh, your Aspen Institute in 2004 at the Einstein Conference. That was uh, excellent. I think your book came out right after that on Albert Einstein. My question is, Walter, I've just recently finished a research paper yeah. entitled Planet Theory, the God equals 7-4 algorithm, yeah. or FOD equals 6-4. That yeah. is the theory of everything. And it includes under its umbrella unified strings theory. And my question is, can I simply just give you a copy of this? Sure. Uh, bring it on up, and I uh, promise you I will not understand it, because on his deathbed, Dr. Einstein was still trying to figure out the unified theory, and he sat there until the lines went off the paper. I'll give it to my friend Brian Green. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have no paper for you. Uh, my question is, for about the last eight years, about two-thirds of the American public has felt the country's on the wrong track. I wanted to know what role you think rapid technological change plays in that, and do you have any advice for people living with innovation and change at the pace that it's happening? Yeah, embrace innovation, embrace change, embrace technology, and understand technology. I wrote this book partly because if you're alienated from your technology, if you think your iPhone is magic and you don't quite know how the GPS works, you're going to be a little bit detached, maybe alienated, and maybe not understand it and be able to deal with it. We should try to understand our technology because our technology is just a tool and it's only as good or as bad as we are. I'm quite optimistic. And everybody, I, come, I live in Washington, D.C., trust me. This is a town where everybody thinks everything is coming apart at the seams. You know, it's not. We live in a country that's still the most creative country, that still does the most innovation, that still pops up with, you know, whether it's Google or Facebook or Apple that still has an economy that even though we couldn't get Congress to figure out what the heck to do, somehow the American people got an economy that's now growing much faster than Europe where everybody thought they knew what to do. We have unemployment going down. But the problem we most face in this country is not that everything's going really bad in this country, is that we have and finally a new sense of prosperity but not everybody is sharing equally in it. We have to include people of color, women, <laughs> others, that's why I love the, you know, the coding project I mentioned that Jim was doing, Launch Code. We need to make sure that every kid in America understands the arts, understands the humanities, understands technology, and learns how to code. And then they're going to feel comfortable, and our moral sense will be able to keep up with our technology. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Walter. Um, I didn't write anything either, but um, oh. <laughs> I'm the daughter of a man who, um, he majored in philosophy in college, went to graduate school, um, was trying to get a PhD in philosophy at Penn, mm -hmm. and was told there are no jobs out there for philosophers. So he left with a master's degree instead of a PhD, and then started to work in the telephone industry, independent mm. telephony specifically. Mm and had no training in electrical engineering, yeah. but was trained as an apprentice um, in the industry, 
and ended up inventing a number of machines for the telephone industry. So there he was, a humanities yeah. person, and was trained in all of this. So my question right. for you is, how can we encourage this today without a degree in engineering? He was a member of IEEE. Right. And how can you I do, do that today? I do think that one of the lessons from that story is that he was able to embrace engineering and apply what he thought about his philosophy to it. I will say I'm not quite probably at his level, but I was going to become a philosopher. I got a graduate degree in philosophy, and I went back to the place where I'd done my undergraduate degree and talked to a couple of professors and said I'd like to pursue a course in philosophy or maybe, if not, journalism. And they both read the dissertation I had done at Oxford, and they both said I would be a good journalist. <laughs> so I ended up in journalism <laughs> instead of being an academic philosopher. But I do think that the understanding of philosophy helps me understand Alan Turing wrestling with free will, Albert Einstein wondering whether God plays dice with the universe, meaning things happen by chance, and everything I've done seems to come back to, including when I wrestle with Edward Snowden or when I wrestle with any concept. So I do think that we got to get unsiloed, that the people who study philosophy have to learn some engineering, and the people who have engineering backgrounds should embrace philosophy. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Isaacson, what, what an honor to actually uh, hear, hear you say. Uh, um, I Thank have um, two sets of friends, and uh, you had a great, brilliant throwaway comment that said um, hackers and people who write software should give it away for free, or they give it away for free. That's their culture, right. and, and you can get the chink in the armor and maybe then ultimately get a six-figure job rewriting their code, but, but the idea of commodification of these innovations. I also have friends who are trying to pay off their student loans by just writing an app. Let me write the app. Let me find. Yeah. Uh, so my, my question is, from your perspective, looking at centuries of genius and scientific yeah. innovators, does the current culture today of what I view as a price tag yeah. on genius affect genius? Or yeah, is that I think that, you know, when I asked Steve Jobs about that, he said, if you're motivated mainly by making a profit, you're going to cut corners in the product you create. You're going to make the circuit board inside just a little bit uglier because you think nobody will see it. But if you really care about your product, you're going to even care about the parts unseen. That circuit board's going to look beautiful. The back of it's going to look beautiful. And he said, that may not seem like the best way to make a profit, but in the end, you will have a more lasting, more profitable enterprise that will create more value. So to me, we all have to take pride in whatever we do and keep our eye on what we're going to put in the river of history, as Steve Jobs said, instead of how much we're going to get to take out of the river. Yeah. Mr. Isaacson, first of all, um, all right, sorry. Actually, and I, I'm going to let Senator Graham, who I do, but one last question, a quick one from Senator okay. Graham, and the rest of you can come on up and I'll answer the questions personally. I'm sorry we're hitting the witching hour. Yes, sir. I'm selling my place at the mic. Yeah, <laughs> on eBay. All right, all right, on eBay, sorry. Uh, first of all, I've read everything you have written, and so uh, I hope you keep on writing. Maybe you won't tell us what your next book's going to be, but I want to make this comment, unless you do. Uh, I want to make this comment. I uh, am now retired, but an attorney who practiced for 41 years in Silicon Valley and represented many of the companies and many of the individuals that you... I'm sorry, I'm getting the hook, so that hit you're me right, with a question. Sorry, don't worry about the hook. Yeah. All right, now, uh, you know, the, the hook's the hook. Okay. Um, an aspect of your book that maybe appeals more to the humanist side of it is Bill Davidow, who was written a book, Marketing High Technology, and went, and went to more venture, said it is marketers that create products not okay, let me inventors. take that on because Steve uh, also and all the people I've looked at said you have to have the product person be your visionary. That is really important to have marketers, finance people, legal people, and everything else. But companies get in trouble where the people running it care more about the, being the CFO or being the marketer than being the person who just has the passion for the product. I know Senator Bob Graham, one of my heroes, was here, and he said, can I ask you a question? So I'm going to do real quick, if I may, a last question from the senator. And congratulations on your daughter becoming a new member of Congress.
Well, I'm not absolutely sure, but here's what I'm chewing on. Uh, I want the question is, what's the next project? And uh, I've always, as you know, been interested in the intersection of art and technology. That's the ultimate. And for many years, I've been interested in the person who best exemplifies that in all of human history. And it would take a long time to climb that mountain because a lot of people have written about him, especially his art. But if you look at the last page of this book, you'll see facing it a drawing. And the drawing is, of course, a Vitruvian man. Leonardo da Vinci's, you know, akimbo drawing in which art and science are brought together in a thing of beauty. So I'd love to spend a decade or so, half time in Florence. <laughs> I wish he had lived in Venice a little bit more than he, you know, because I kind of like Venice too. But I would love to try to capture what it was like in the Renaissance to not just combine art and science, but to believe that there was no real difference between art and science. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Our next program is starting at 1. If you already have a ticket, you may stay in your seats. But if you do not, please exit gracefully. Thank you.